Hey everybody, welcome to the program. I am so very excited because we have a very special guest here at the Vinyl Pad. Loves lead guitarist Johnny Eccles. Thank you so much, man, for being on the program. It's my pleasure. I wanted to talk about Forever Changes for a very long time. And I just want to get right into it. You were born in Memphis, Tennessee. Yeah. And then somehow you ended up in Los Angeles. Tell me about that. Arthur, Arthur Lee, he was the lead singer and also one of the oh. songwriters in the group. He lived in Memphis also. So my grandparents were friends with his parents and grandparents before our mothers were even born. So oh, I mean, okay. we go back a very long way. We were neighbors in Memphis. His family left first. I think I was about four or five years old. And I think Arthur's a couple of years older. And a few months later, we left. And we ended up living next door to each other without ever realizing that. I heard him outside yelling at some. They were playing football in the streets, you know, and I heard him yelling, throw the ball to me or something. And then I went down and sure enough, there he was. So we call that serendipity. So That's amazing. It, it was meant to be, I guess. I was going to ask you what you thought of him the first time you met him, but you must have been so small. Like, yeah. He, he must have always been there. Yeah, you? he's just always been there. He's like my big brother, basically. Yeah. I never knew a time in life until, of course, when he passed, that he wasn't there. Who were some of your early influences? Living in our neighborhood was Adolph Jacobs, and he was a member of the Coasters. He's a guitar player in the Coasters. And he saw me coming from one of my lessons with the guitar, and he asked, if he could see it and I took it out and showed him and he said oh, man, this is a piece of shit you can't play <laughs> on this thing and so he had another nice guitar it was a Vega it was a professional jazz box and he says this is what you need to play with so Adolf came and he uh, taught me and, and uh, wow. so that was cool. Another friend was Little Richard. He had relatives in the area, so he would always come by and we would see him in the area. And so everybody would rush over because Richard would hand out dollars. And he saw me again with the guitar and he took me under his wing and told me about the music business and all of that. You know, and years later, of course, by the time I learned to play, that, that information became you know, very valuable. But at the time, I was more interested in the dollars he was giving away. By the time I was like 12, I was actually able to play and earn money playing. Arthur at that time, he was an athlete, so he wasn't really interested in music. When I got to high school, I formed a group with Billy Preston and Marilyn McCoo of the Fifth Dimension. We all went to school together and uh, there's a fellow, Clarence McDonald, who was an arranger for Ray Charles and uh, the Fifth Dimension and many other groups. We were playing at an assembly in school and Arthur came and saw all the attention that we were getting. <laughs> and asked if he could join the group. Of course, of course. But he wasn't a musician at that time. He had started playing accordion, but he wasn't really what you'd call a musician. Arthur Lee playing accordion. Yeah, he played accordion. <laughs> so he came aboard basically playing conga drums and bongos. And we noticed that he had such a rapport with the audience that, that we didn't have. He was really mm. able to communicate. And so when Billy left to pursue his gospel career, Arthur took his place as vocalist and uh, minor keyboardist. He really still hadn't gotten, but his parents bought him an organ so he could play, and he's uh, he improved exponentially. Henry Vestine was with the Can Heat, and he joined that group, and we played fraternity parties, and and uh, so it's kind of moved from there. When did the first seeds of love form? We were the grassroots first, and then we were the American Four. Then there was a Booker T and the MG, so we had a group called Arthur Lee and the LAGs, which was Los Angeles group, and the MGs like was Memphis group. And we had about the same personnel, but there were six different names, depending on what we were playing. It was basically the same group of guys. So it just, it just sort of evolved right, over yeah. the years. Mm -hmm. And, and eventually, I'm assuming, these original tunes started coming out. Right, yes. Right after hearing Booker T and the MG's Green Onions, we started doing instrumentals and songs that were reminiscent of theirs. And we got a record contract with Bob Keen at Delphi Records. We uh, released a song called Soul Food, which was reminiscent, a slower version of Green Onions. And that was like the that. first record we did. It didn't do very well, but it did get some airplay. But we continued playing, as I said, the frat parties and weddings and bar mitzvahs and things and we got a job in Hollywood at a place called the Brave New World and that's where we were the grassroots there and Lou Adler the record producer Lou Adler came and he was rather inebriated and he was with this young lady and he was trying to impress her yeah. So he had heard us play and he comes up and he tells us we were going to be the next Beatles and that he was going to do so much for us. At that point, we'd never heard of Lou Adler, so we didn't know yeah. who the hell he was, this just drunk guy. 
So <laughs> Brian and I told him that he'd have to speak with our manager. We thought that's the way to handle it. Yeah. Well, it wasn't because he thought we were shining him on. Oh, and he no. started, you'll never work in this town again. And I dare oh, you disrespect man. me. I mean, he because he was so drunk, he took it the wrong way about Oh, a month, six weeks later, one of our uh, the people that come to the Brave New World said, wow, we heard your new record. So we don't have a record. And we found out that it was done through Lou Adler. So him knowing that we were called the grassroots and we oh, had, no. you know, hundreds of people would come into this little club. They were with standing room only. And he knew that if he released this record, if one record store was doing extremely well, they would be put on the, the top 100 list. And so that helped that record record get take off because people went out and bought it without knowing it wasn't us rather than fight which we probably could have won because we had the poor man's copyright where you do a registered letter to yourself yeah and, I've done that yeah <laughs> so we did that and we did and, and a couple of lawyers told us we could probably win but it was going to cost a fortune and we didn't have a fortune yeah. So Arthur had worked at this place called Love Braziers. And so Brian and Arthur and I were driving past. And I told Brian, you know, Arthur used to work here. Well, of course, we started laughing and, and you know, <laughs> kidding Arthur about it. But it was L-U-V. Yeah. Braziers. And uh, Brian said, man, that would be a great name for a group. And we all said, yeah, that would really be cool. And then we right there decided that that would be our new name. And we also decided that we would do a real copyright and a real title search and all that so that we could actually own that name. Yeah. And we became love and uh, legally. So you guys got signed to Electra. Tell me what that was like as, as a musician, because from an outsider's perspective, that's kind of always the dream, right? Get signed to a big label. Well, we had been offered an opportunity to sign with Warner, Columbia, Capital, and MCA also, but none of them would allow us to own the copyrights and own the publishing and the rights to our songs. And Electra was the only one that said, yeah, you can own the publishing, which we still own. And that was, again, from Little Richard. I was going to ask, yeah. He said, you should own your stuff. You don't want anybody to take it from you. And we were probably one of the first groups at that time to actually own the masters and own the rights to our songs. Wow. which we still do. When I buy this music, I'm directly supporting yes, you. Yes, you are. That's awesome. <laughs> right. That's awesome. Yeah, and that, that works out. As I said, it worked to our advantage, and a lot of groups now do that. I love the Love logo. Do you recall anything about that? Like yeah, that, that was um, Bill Harvey. He was the vice president of Electra Records, okay. and he came up with that, so we had nothing to do with it. Did you even have a say in whether you liked it or not? Well, yeah, of course. Oh, okay. We could have turned it down if we, but, yeah. you know, it, it looked cool, so he said, yeah, yeah that's great. Yeah. And it had the male, female, the, the, the symbol oh, yeah. that many people don't even recognize no, that. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, see. I love that. The first two albums I was listening to, they really are complimentary. They, they feel like one came right after the next one versus yeah, kind that, of this, this departure. Describe sort of the events or, or the feelings that led to this album. Well, see, that was supposed to be a different, it was meant to be a two album set. And Brian McLean is uh, the, the other uh, guitar player, he's a rhythm guitar player. He was also a songwriter and singer as myself and Arthur. We wanted to have an opportunity to kind of showcase ourselves more. With the two album set, Brian and I would get to do seven or eight songs. Arthur would do his amount. And uh, we considered it our magnum opus. We had learned yeah. a new phrase. And that was what <laughs> we went around saying that that was going to be. Yeah. But uh, at the last minute, Electra reneged on it, saying it would be too expensive. And so we ended up with a lot of drama behind recording that. Because Brian just kind of mutinied when he realized they weren't going to do his music. He just refused to play the songs that Arthur had written, wow. you know, with the same panache that he normally would. And so everybody kept saying, come on, Brian, snap out of it. But, you know, he was pissed and you can't blame him. So they brought in people from the wrecking crew and then we would do like the flourishes and I'd play the guitar solos and all of that to try to make it sound like us. Well, they played a couple of songs and it just didn't. Carol Kay is a tremendous bass player. She's yeah. fantastic. But she did not sound like Kenny Forsey, our bass player. And he ended up trying to teach her 
what he would play. And Arthur and I both looked at that and said, this doesn't make a damn bit of sense no. to have these people here when we're right here. So everybody kind of got together and talked and decided that we're just going to finish this album. Jack came in with some incentives. He offered us a lot more money. So we got back into the studio and within a, a week or two, we had finished it and it was ready to go. But it had taken months and we were getting nowhere and we were on the verge of just walking away then until cooler heads prevailed and we were able to, to pull it off. When Electra reneged on the, the dual album, the double album, uh, we kind of lost any faith in them and we were trying our best to get out of our contract. And so MCA came up and offered us a huge sum of money if we would leave Electra and sign with them. So we came up with a brilliant idea. Why not hook them up with the doors? So we knew Jim Morrison, he yeah. was always you know, around Hollywood. So we thought if we hooked them up with the doors, they'd have a rock group and they'd let us go. You know, we were still kids, naive, not realizing you know, how stupid that was. They were not gonna let us go. They were making money. We signed a seven year contract and they held us to it. So we basically shot ourselves in the ass. They stopped. Uh, promoting us and spent all of the money that would have been spent on promoting love and sending us on tours and sponsoring the tours it all went to the doors it worked out great for them the doors would come see you guys play like they looked up to you obviously you you threw them a bone getting them on electra was there ever any animosity oh after no that? no no okay no, never never no they didn't do anything wrong jim had been asking me for years to hook them up with electra i don't want to get you in trouble but were there any contemporaries of love that you just couldn't stand. Yeah, well, Neil Young is one. I've known Neil, but he just bothers me. Just something about Neil has always gotten on my nerves. The so. music or the person? Just him. No, his music, I think, is cool. It's just <laughs> okay. Neil that can kind yeah. of rub me the wrong yeah. way. But the thing is, we've known each other so long, I probably rub him the wrong way too, so it's, an, you know, it's a two-way street. He was never going to be involved. Oh, yeah, producing? he was. Because um, he denies it. Yeah, no, he was. <laughs> he was totally broke from what I understand. Bruce Botnick, who was the engineer, was really close to Neil. And because Neil was broke, he wanted to give him uh, producer credit. So he came in oh, okay. and spent a couple of hours working on Forever Changes. But as soon as we saw him, we started laughing because nobody's going to listen to Neil. You know, we hung out with him, got high with him. Now we're going to yeah. have him produce us. So that, that was a non-starter. But he was there for the first couple of hours and then enough to get, you know, uh, money from Electra. And uh, I think they paid him his full producer salary just to go away because there was yeah. enough drama happening there without him adding more to it. Did it feel different recording this? Oh, absolutely, yeah. Well, first of all, we're in there with these guys from the LA Philharmonic and yeah. here we are, guys at 27th Street, you know, <laughs> playing with these people in there with the cellos and the, you know, the violins and stuff and it was cool. That was Arthur's idea, right? The idea to add the strings was Arthur's idea, yeah. but the order of the songs and all that was a group effort and also all of the music actually was a group effort. Arthur was a fantastic poet, but he wasn't much of a musician. As you notice, he doesn't play on any of the, of yeah. the records, but he never really wanted to be a musician. He wanted to be a poet, songwriter, singer, and he was yeah. superb at that. As far as the music is concerned, the group members wrote their individual parts. It was a fantastic experience, I'll say it that way. There's a story that I've read many times mm -hmm. about the title for Ever changes. How Arthur overheard a conversation between a friend breaking up with. No, that was actually Arthur. Oh, that was Arthur. Yeah, okay. he. One of his girlfriends said uh, that you told me that you were gonna love me forever, and Arthur said, "Well, forever changes," and yeah. that's how he remembered okay. that. And Brian had remembered the, that and said, "Man, that would be a great title." And that was supposed to be just kind of a working title, and that ended up actually being the title. Well, especially when you combine it, love forever changes. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. It's brilliant. Yeah, it worked out cool, yeah. And then tell me about the cover. Do you remember much about, what, was there other concepts thrown around for this? Yeah, we looked at several different pictures and photographs of things that he was interested in using, but everybody thought that this was cool because it was so trippy to look at, especially <laughs> it looked like kind of an acid trip, you know? Yeah. And so everybody agreed that that was the one. And people think it looks like Africa, but no, it's a, actually a heart. On the back here, obviously it's you guys hanging out. Tell me about your pose here. What's the backstory? This was at Arthur's house. If you ever saw the movie, The Trip, there was this house that had a swimming pool that half of it was on the inside of the house and half of it, well, that's there and we're 
on the balcony. Mike, the drummer, he's at the far right, he came through and he kicked that little vase and he apologized, but Arthur picked it up. He's standing there with a broken vase. It looks trippy and looks like it has some meaning, but sometimes things are just what they are. Alone Again and Or. Or mm -hmm. Alone Again, again or, or, yeah. Yeah. Who plays the flamenco guitar? The yeah, I'm guitar? playing that, and Brian plays wow. a rhythm guitar on that. So this started out being a kind of a bluegrass song. It wasn't meant to have really? a Spanish feel, yeah. And we were waiting on a studio session guy that played banjo because none of us could play banjo. And we tried, and I tried, Brian tried, we just couldn't do it. And so I was sitting in the corner noodling, warming up, and I'm doing kind of a Spanish stuff. And David Angel, who was the guy that arranged all of this, heard that, and he liked that. He convinced Brian that maybe we should change the feel of the song. And so we did. And I Do you have a personal favorite track on here? Mm, yeah, House Is Not A Motel would be my favorite one. At my house I've got no shackles, you can come and look if you want to. The headphone system broke down. I could hear the first part of it when I put the first solo down, but I couldn't hear the second one. <laughs> Actually, I'm trying to play from memory what I thought I played the first time. And Arthur's in the booth and he's going up doing these making motion to tell me, okay, go up higher here, go down lower. So he's giving me hand signals as to how to play. So that was a really an interesting situation. You know? Sometimes the, the magic's in, in those little mistakes, yeah, those yeah. little accidents. Everything works out the way it should. So the album comes out and it didn't do as well as expected or? Well, it wasn't promoted. It wasn't promoted. By then the doors were really, really taking off. Electro was really involved with that and spending money promoting the doors. And we did a, an American tour. We went uh, back east and we went to a lot of the Midwest and the parts of this country that we could play, we did. We tried to promote it as best we could, but most of it was word of mouth. And so it did much, much better in Europe. And we still have a huge audience in, in Spain and Greece and Italy and places in the UK. So really we have Electra to blame for... <laughs> well, that was, you know, they're a business. And yeah. So they had their own interests and their own yeah. agenda. Had we not initiated them, you know, hooking up with the doors, it would have probably worked out differently. But you never know. We could have gotten on one of those tiny planes, which we did all the time, and it could have gone into the mountains. So who knows? You know, things work out the way they should. The documentary Love Story, mm -hmm. one of the big things it tries to paint is Arthur's reluctance to want to tour outside of the LA area. There were several reasons why we didn't tour as much as we should have, but mainly it was because of the times. There were so many places in this country being a mixed race group that we could not play. They just weren't ready for that at that point. And they would uh, book us to come and play and then they realized the makeup of our group and all of a sudden the gig would be canceled. Or they would ask us wow. to play to segregated audiences, which we would refused to be part of that silliness. Rather than just admit that we were still caught up in something as uncool as that, we just said we would just assume not to or and stay in Los Angeles. But we were musicians, that was our livelihood, and we were not independently wealthy. So we wanted to play and we played everywhere that we could, but with the exception of Texas, uh, that was the only place in the South that we could play. Actually, because we could get in a car and drive to Santa Barbara or Sacramento or wherever. It was cheaper for us just to do that and we would end up making the same amount of money but with less expenses. So it came out to our advantage a lot of times to play on the West Coast. It sounded like it, it wasn't necessarily up to you guys. No, it wasn't. So unfortunately, the original lineup of Love didn't last. Yeah. Can you summarize a few things of why that happened? Unbeknownst to any of us, Jack had gone you know, behind our backs and worked out a deal with Brian saying if Brian came back and uh, finished uh, Forever Changes, that he would do a solo album. I thought it's fine, you know, he could, yeah. you know. So Brian calls me and tells me, I said, well, cool, let's go by and, and talk with Arthur about that. And Arthur fired Brian immediately. 
on the spot as soon as he said wow. that I'm going to do a solo album. He said, good, congratulations, Brian, you're fired. We tried with the rest of the guys to play, and we did gigs at the Santa Monica Civic and a couple of other places, but it just wasn't there. The feeling wasn't yeah. there. The sound wasn't there. Brian was an integral part of that group. We just decided it, it's time to kind of to go our separate ways. Arthur went on to record a couple more albums yeah, as he did Love several. Uh -huh. with other members. Yeah, he did. It just never was the same. I don't think Arthur's heart was in it. The first album they did called For Sale. Now, those songs were songs that the original group had worked on anyway. Okay. They just basically played uh, stuff that we'd already worked out. But after that, it just kind of stayed in kind of a holding pattern and Arthur would get together people and try to keep it alive and you know he was able to. So we were offered tremendous sums of money to put the group back together and go on world tours and we tried and then Arthur ends up getting arrested and yeah. going to jail then Brian dies and then I realize at that point the universe just doesn't want us to do this. When Arthur gets out of prison we started again and uh, we had these people from a group called Baby Lemonade and they were really cool people. We started playing with them, Arthur and I, and we got to do what the original love didn't, which was travel all over the world. What was that like, reuniting with, with Arthur after? Oh, it was cool. You know, yeah. I'd seen Arthur. We'd talk to each other. Yeah. And sometimes he'd come to New York and stay with me, or I'd come to Los Angeles and trip, because I was doing studio work and living in New York. So we were always, you know, uh, at, in close contact. But as far as playing on stage, it was, you know, just like getting back on the horse. It was cool. very simple. We just did it, and it worked out cool. Do you have a favorite? album of these three? Well, yeah, Forever Changes would be my favorite because it kind of pushed the envelope a bit and changed the direction of where we were going. And we had plans of going uh, further into kind of a jazz fusion thing when all of the drama that surfaced surrounding this ended up causing us just to, you know, to go our own ways. To create this album out of all of that, I mean, it just... Yeah, that's all the more amazing yeah. that it actually came out of it. But the album is dark, but there are some, you know, optimistic points, you know, but it was meant to be dark. You know, it, it was a reflection of the times in which we lived. This has been recognized now. It's number 40 on the greatest albums of all times, Rolling Stones, top 500. Yeah, and the European critics, actually, it's number one yeah. for the rock critics. And your beats out Sgt. Pepper and all of Jimmy's and everybody. So yeah. it worked out cool. I mean, that so. must be such a satisfaction. Absolutely. Of course that. it is to have people appreciate and yeah. respect your work, yes. Looking back mm -hmm. and... What are you most proud of? I'm proud of having lasted this long to have remained relevant. And I'm proud of, of that, of all of our records, actually. And proud that we kind of opened the door for a lot of other musicians. Thank you so much for, for sharing welcome. your stories and, and just being here. This yeah. means a lot to me. It's quite cool. an honor. It's my pleasure. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Really appreciate it. Uh -huh. Guys, check out the site. Catch them live when you can. Thank you so much for watching. I am your Vinyl Geek, and I'll catch you on the flip side. A lot of times people contact me because they heard this story and they've got a bet going. <laughs> <laughs> this happened or, you know, so I'll, I'll oh, try and great. answer.